consider the case of Mrs. Alex Fournier, a 62-year-old Mandan Indian woman, and her foster child, Ivan Brown, who were living on this reservation in North Dakota on Fort Totten, near the Devil Flakes, uh, which is the Devil Flakes Sioux uh, group, who are now known as the Spirit Lake Sioux. <coughs> One day in 1968, a pair of white men showed up, with, up at the door of Mrs. Fournier. This is what it looks like in the summertime. There. <laughs> Robert Barrett, the director of the Benson County Welfare Board in North Dakota, and the Benson County Sheriff had come to remove Ivan Brown and place him for adoption with a white uh, doctor and his wife in Bismarck. Mrs. Fournier had mothered 18 other children some her biological children, others foster children. Ivan had been just three weeks old when social welfare authorities had removed him from his mother and placed him with Mrs. Fournier. And by the way, I never was able to find her first name in the records. She always wanted to be known by that. The authorities told Mrs. Fournier that it would only be temporary, but no state welfare workers contacted her again until Barrett and the sheriff arrived unannounced at her home. In the intervening two years, Ivan's birth mother had died in a fire, and Mrs. Fournier had become deeply attached to Ivan. She refused to give him up when Barrett and the sheriff barged into her home. They tried to take him, and when they came after him, I said no, she told the Senate Subcommittee on Indian Affairs in 1974. He started crying and hanging on to me. According to an investigator in 1968, only by the immediate on-the-spot intervention of Mrs. Joshua, another Indian woman, and the later imposition of Mr. Goodhouse, the tribal chairman, was the forcible removal of Ivan prevented at that time. And the investigator added, Mrs. Fournier has threatened to kill herself or person or persons attempting to take the child from her. And that threat was not taken lightly by any of the persons to whom I talked. Although she may not have realized it at the time, Mrs. Fournier's har harrowing experience was not exceptional. In the 1960s and 70s, countless other Indian women across the country, mothers, aunties, grandmothers, and caretakers like Mrs. Fournier, and many Indian men too, had confronted state authorities who sought to remove their children to be fostered or adopted by non-Indian families. In fact, an estimated 25 to 35 percent of all Indian children had been separated from their families and either institutionalized, fostered, or adopted within non-Indian families at this time. With these epidemic number, numbers, a true Indian child welfare crisis had erupted Explanations for this crisis diverged sharply. Authorities such as Barrett, who had been trying to remove other Indian children from their foster families on the Fort Totten Reservation, deemed many Indian families to be unfit to raise their children. <coughs> when questioned by a reporter about his efforts, he asserted, basically, what we look at is, is this the type of family uh, or is this the type of home that you would place your own child into? And I don't mean from a physical standpoint, he said. I mean, are these foster parents the kinds of people you would want to be caring for your child? In essence, Barrett held these seasoned Indian caregivers, like Mrs. Fournier, in contempt. He and other authorities instead promoted the placement of allegedly forgotten Indian children in white adoptive families as an act of benevolent rescue. Members of the Devil's Lake Sioux and other tribes contested this portrayal of their family relationships and homes as unfit for children. They experienced this state intervention not as benevolence, but as the latest manifestation of a brutal government policy bent on their destruction. They charged that welfare workers often used ethnocentric and middle-class criteria to remove children from their homes without evidence of true neglect or abuse. Tribal officials conceded that there were occasions when parents, like that of Ivan Brown, his mother, 
who could not properly care for their children, but they believed they could find other caretakers within their communities, like Mrs. Fournier. In contrast to Barrett and other welfare authorities, tribes revered elders and regarded them as just the kind of people you would want to care for your child. Activists, social workers, psychologists, sociologists, and legal scholars became polarized over the issue of Indian child welfare in the 60s and 70s. And today, the issue still generates fierce controversy on blogs, talk radio, newspapers, and Dr. Phil. The baby Veronica case made national headlines and sparked a much needed public debate on the issue for a brief time. But other 2013 Supreme Court rulings eclipsed the case. You may recall, uh, the High Court overturned the Defense of Marriage Act uh, that same year, as well as key provisions of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And those dramatic rulings captured the majority of media attention. As Americans debated the diverging implications of these rulings for gay equality and African American rights, the story of Veronica receded from the headlines of all but American Indian media. Yet the baby Veronica case and the history of the Indian child welfare crisis behind it, I would argue, is every bit as relevant to equality and rights for all Americans as the other two landmark rulings. I would also say that the story is not just an American Indian story, but a profoundly American story. For every Indian family that lost a child to foster care or adoption, another non-Indian American family gained a son or daughter, a brother or sister. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, or the BIA as I'll call them, and state government agencies enlisted thousands of American families in their plan to end Indian dependence on government assistance to solve what they always called the Indian problem. The history of the Indian child welfare crisis is inescapably an American story, but a paradoxical one with competing narrators, tangled plot lines, and a cast of complex characters. Many non-Indians became concerned with American Indians in the two decades following World War II. The nation as a whole flourished economically, as you all know, after World War II, but it became apparent through news reports, government studies, and church chronicles that American Indians had not shared in the bounty. By all socioeconomic indicators, Indians in this era endured the most extreme hardship of any American minority. They had the highest rates of unemployment and suicide, and the lowest incomes and life expectancies and their infant mortality rate was nearly three times as high among Indians as the general population in the 1950s. Dire economic conditions on reservations led many Indian families to depend on public assistance. One of the things that surprised me in my research for this book was I found that many white Americans were very sympathetic to American Indians in this period, and they had often very radical critiques of what Indian people were suffering and, and fairly radical solutions to those. Many mainline Protestant church authorities and liberal writers uh, who were concerned with the Indian plight, as they so often put it, to them this represented a source of national shame and an urgent social issue. And they blamed Indian poverty on past and present government policies as well as unscrupulous non-Indians who built Indian people out of uh, economic resources. What they proposed as a solution to the, uh, the problems Indian people suffered was increased self-determination and economic development. Their solutions, however, were not the solutions that people in government were proposing. By contrast, many legislators and policymakers insisted that an aggressive drive toward assimilation was necessary, and they developed a new federal Indian policy in this era known as termination and relocation. This called for an elimination of the Indians' unique tribal status vis-a-vis -vis the federal government, 
as well as the increased relocation of Indians to urban areas as a means to promote their employment. Key to this uh, issue of Indian child welfare, too, uh, the government called for the transfer of many responsibilities for Indian affairs from the federal government to the states, including responsibilities for Indian children. Everybody likes to look at this uh, slide, so I'll take a drink while you enjoy it. <laughs> Indian children and the, their removal from their families became central to this assimilation campaign, as Indian children had almost a century before. Government administrators in the late 19th century had posited that they could transform Indian dependents into self-sufficient members of American society by removing children from what they believed to be the stultifying environment of tribal life. Thousands of Indian children up to the 1930s experienced removal, often coercive removal, from their families and communities and endured institutionalization in one of the dozens of boarding schools for at least a portion of their childhoods. After World War II, authorities in the government came to believe that the boarding schools had failed and miserably. Few Indian children who attended the schools assim assimilated into white America Instead, they met children from other tribes and were likely to develop a new pan-Indian identity. What's more, some impoverished families, like that of Adam Fortunate Eagle, who wrote his autobiography, had begun to use the schools to make sure their children received adequate meals, shelter, and clothing. The BIA believed now that the boarding schools were an expensive anachronism that caused more problems than they solved. And they now sought to close most of them, except for Alaska Natives and Navajos. They continued to promote boarding school education for these two groups, for whom they deemed day school education in their communities too expensive. Many Indian people also critiqued the boarding schools in this era, but for very different reasons. They charged that generations of child removal and institutional upbringing had damaged Indian families. Officials removed children at a crucial time in their upbringing, so they missed out not only on an education in their cultures and languages, but also on learning the proper way to raise children within extended family networks. And the boarding school regimes often exposed children to brutal corporal punishment, harsh military style discipline, and sometimes sexual abuse. So many Indian families had resisted the removal of their children to the boarding schools since their inception, and instead they had sought day schools within their communities. For a brief time in the 1950s, the desire of most Indian peoples to keep their families intact and the government's displeasure with the boarding schools converged. The BIA charged its new branch of welfare with closing down the boarding schools and transferring the responsibility for the education and care of Indian children to states. The BIA hired a, a fascinating woman named Alita Brownlee to be their child welfare consultant. And her staff conducted annual reviews of thousands of Indian children still enrolled in the boarding schools and sought to transfer their care back to their families and their education to their state's public school systems. BIA welfare workers initially in the 1950s concerned themselves with preventing Indian family breakdown and disintegration, and they took <coughs> steps to strengthen Indian family supports as they de-enrolled many Indian children from the boarding schools. This was another surprise to me in my research. I didn't realize the BIA had actually engaged in this kind of effort. This commitment to rebuild Indian families after decades of child removal did not last long, however. Termination policy mandated that the welfare branch eventually transfer Indian child welfare services to state social service agencies. And many state bureaucrats, like Robert Barrett, rarely made the same efforts to keep Indian families together as the BIA welfare branch had done. Instead, state agencies increasingly regarded foster care and adoption 
in non-Indian families as the best solution for the dependent Indian children in their care. By the late 1950s, the BIA, too, had become enthusiastic about adoption. Intense public interest in the adoption of Indian children may have motivated them. I found hundreds of letters from would-be adopters who wrote to the BIA to request help in adopting an Indian child. Here's an, an example of one of them. J.R. Bryant of Atlanta requested an Indian boy, two years old, and a girl, aged one, from Wyoming or Oklahoma. Very specific. He added that he would like to go and pick out a couple. And this is typical. There were hundreds of such letters in, there are hundreds of such letters in the National Archives that you can find. At some point, the BIA uh, started to think that this might be a good solution uh, to the problem of dependent Indian children. And in 1958, Alita Brownlee contracted with the Child Welfare League of America, which was a highly regarded umbrella organization of private and public child placement agencies, to set up uh, the Indian Adoption Project, or uh, I'll call it IAP. The IAP developed a permanent interstate plan for the placement of Indian children requiring adoption, as it put, primarily in non-Indian adoptive homes in the eastern area. So they uh, targeted Indian children primarily in western and midwestern states and their placement in homes primarily on the east coast. The Child Welfare League of America hired a former white BIA worker named Arnold Lislow to head the IAP from 1959 to 1967. The IAP was the most public and well-known effort to promote Indian adoption, but it placed just 395 Indian children in adoptive homes in its 10 years of existence. In 1968, the Child Welfare League of America incorporated the IAP into a new project called Adoption Resource Exchange of North America, or ARENA, for what it called hard to place or special needs children. And it placed several hundred more Indian children within non-Indian adopted families up until the passage of ICWA in 1978. Many more Indian children, however, entered state child welfare systems. And those systems often placed them in foster or adoptive homes within their own states. Lislow regularly traveled across the United States to support such efforts and boasted that he'd referred well over 5,000 prospective adoptive families for Indian children <coughs> to state agencies. Thus, although the IAP uh, placed just you know, uh, several hundred children, uh, it exerted a very significant influence on policies and practices within states in their child welfare systems. Similar trends were occurring in Australia and Canada at the same time, and I really don't have time today to, to really um, extend this, but if it's a teaser for the book. If you want to buy the book, you can read a lot more about this. Um, and uh, you can also, of course, ask me lots of questions about this later. Uh, in Canada, uh, the Canadian province, all the provinces, but particularly Saskatchewan, developed a very uh, intensive effort called AIM, ironically, <laughs> Adopt Indian Métis uh, program that was to promote in, in very much the same way that the Indian Adoption Project did, uh, to increase demand for Indian children and to increase placement of Indian children in non-Indian homes. As well, Australia uh, in all of its states as well, had some very uh, aggressive efforts to place Aboriginal children in non-Aboriginal homes. I'm going to switch back to the U.S. now. I'm probably not going to come back to this, uh, but if you want to know more, we can come back at the end. Arnold Lislow justified the need for the Indian Adoption Project in two primary ways. First, he contended that the rate of out-of-wedlock births among Indian women was very high, although he admitted he didn't really know what that rate was. 
He also lamented that, quote, services to Indian unmarried mothers have been extremely limited, and therefore very few unmarried mothers are ever given any choice but to keep their children. In essence, he claimed that unwed Indian women had been denied opportunities to place their children for adoption that were available to other American women. So he's kind of co-opting the language of choice uh, in this era. Second, Lislow asserted that Indian children had been forgotten. During the past decade, he wrote, there have been many programs designed to promote the adoption of all children, the handicapped child, the child in the older age group, children of other racial groups, both within the United States and from foreign lands. But the Indian child has remained the forgotten child, left unloved and uncared for on the reservation, without a home or parents he can call his own. <coughs> Lislow and other policymakers use the fashionable, colorblind, liberal language of the Cold War era to assert that the IAP would bring greater equality to Indian children by providing them with a new opportunity to be adopted. This approach to Indian child welfare lay much of the blame for Indian children's supposedly forgotten plight on their own families. Lislow's character characterization of the Indian child as unloved and uncared for, notice in the passive voice, scripted Indian parents and families as shadowy, offstage figures who had neglected their children and now had little to, role to play in the liberal drama of rescuing the Indian child. And Lislow's use of the singular, singular forgotten child to stand in for all Indian children had the effect of denigrating all Indian families as unloving and uncaring, and positioning all Indian children as in potential need of removal to a new home with new parents. Thus, the IAP extend, extended a hand of assistance to the individual Indian child, while with the other hand, it virtually slapped down his or her family. Ironically, the IAP's approach was at odds with the very policies the Child Welfare League of America had drafted in this period. These policies instructed social workers to make strenuous efforts to keep families intact rather than removing children without just cause. So the very policies that the CWLA was enacting in this period for non-Indians, they were using the almost exact different practices against Indian families. Adoption supporters increasingly conveyed these characterizations of Indian family life with single images and a minimum of text. Lislow included this photograph of an Indian toddler in an article he wrote for Catholic Charities, and its caption, Dead End or a Chance, encapsulated this dual characterization of Indian pathology and the benevolence of adoption in minimal text and, and photograph. These kinds of narratives became ubiquitous among non-Indian Americans in the late 50s and 1960s. Lislow deployed this imagery and rhetoric as he sought to increase the demand for Indian children among white families. A great deal of his work, and later that of the arena director, centered on public relations. Lislow placed articles on Indian adoption like this one in popular magazines like Good Housekeeping, as well as religious publications and even family planning journals. He mentioned in 1967 that as a result of the publicity he generated in 1966, he'd received 1,200 inquiries regarding the adoption of Indian children. The Indian Adoption Project arose from and reinforced the climate of liberalism in the 1950s and its emphasis on colorblindness, what Peggy Pascoe defines as the powerfully persuasive belief that the eradication of racism depend, depends upon the deliberate non-recognition of race. Liberals who championed colorblindness in the late 50s and 60s viewed it as the celebrated end of racism, 
But PASCO considers it a racial ideology all of its own. IAP director Lislow worked to cultivate demand for Indian adoptees by exploiting liberal Americans' colorblind aspirations to reach across racial boundaries and undo legacies of colonial mistrust. In fact, adoption advocates characterize adoption as a means of rectifying past injustices. Many well-meaning families, uh, liberal families, in fact, took up the charge, including the Dawes family, which I know Ellen has written a lot about. Um, in opposition to the Indian Child Welfare Act, for example, one white woman wrote, we cannot point with pride to the results of government policies during the past 150 years. In fact, we should be ashamed of the way Indians have been treated. It seems to me that this present day trend towards person to person assistance should be encouraged, not frustrated. Bureaucratic authorities carefully steered this kind of sentiment, this desire to break down racial boundaries toward their solution, the removal and adoption of Indian children. Thus, the Indian Adoption Project claimed to be responding with humanitarianism to the problem of forgotten Indian children born to unwed Indian women. And it claimed to have found a ready solution through the colorblind goodwill and desire for reconciliation among liberal Americans. From the perspective of Indian women like that of Mrs. Fournier, however, the government's new schemes represented a traumatic assault on the very heart of their communities. Many young Indian women complained that they had experienced intense pressure from social workers and other authorities to put their newborn infants up for adoption. Cheryl Spider de Coteau of the Sisseton Wapitan tribe in South Dakota testified to a US Senate subcommittee in 1974 that one of her children had been removed while staying with a babysitter. While pregnant with another child, De Coteau recounted, a male social worker kept coming over to the house every week and they kept talking to me and asking if I would give him up for adoption and said that it would be best. They kept coming and coming and finally when I did have him, the social worker came to the hospital. After I came home with the baby, the social worker came over to the house. He asked me if I would give him up for adoption, and I said no. The social worker persisted. He made weekly visits to De Coteau's home. Finally, the social worker demanded that De Coteau come to his office to sign some papers. When they took me in the office there, the social worker went and called another lady to watch the baby in the next room until I got done, De Coteau recalled. I was kind of sick then, and I didn't know what I was signing. The social worker then refused to return her now four-month-old baby, four-month-old son Bobby, as soon as she signed the papers. Like De Coteau, many Indian women uh, who signed consent forms claimed that they were not aware that the form they had signed made their child available for adoption or terminated their parental rights. At least one copy of a consent form that I have found does not clearly state its intent. This form is titled authorization for discharge of infant child to person other than parent and related matters. It's very misleading if you read it. It does not explicitly state that the parent is giving the child up for adoption or terminating her or his parental rights. But this was uh, given to BIA social workers who were working with Indian women uh, who unwed mothers in hospitals. Many Indian women testified that social workers had coaxed or bullied them into signing such a form and relinquishing their children. State authorities may have been complying with the letter of the law regarding consent, but they clearly engaged in a lot of coercion and subterfuge. But many of you may know that Indian women's experiences with this kind of coercion were not unique in this period, and this is something, again, that Ellen has written about extensively. Social workers also sought to compel young, white, middle-class, unwed mothers to put their babies up for adoption in this time period. And between 1945 and 1973, unwed mothers relinquished an estimated one and a half million babies for non-family adoptions due to such pressure. 
Yet Indian women faced more intense scrutiny and intimidation to give up their babies because of stereotypes of them as unfit mothers, the notion that nearly all of them were unwed, and popular perceptions of dysfunctional Indian family life. Moreover, the consequence of removing Indian infants from their mothers not only infringed upon their individual rights as women, as it did with so many unwed white women, but it also undermined the very viability of Indian tribes and violated their rights to exist as a distinct group. Unlike American society in general, Indian communities saw little problem with unwed motherhood and readily accepted children born out of wedlock into extended kin networks. Stella Hospior, a BIA social worker on the Sisseton Reservation in South Dakota, acknowledged that we never hear a disparaging tone or term used in speaking of the illegitimate child. We do not sense that most members of the tribe see a lack of a father person as a big problem for the child. And in fact, in Indian communities, it was common and desirable for extended family members, especially grandparents, to take in and raise their kin. In actuality, then, unwed Indian mothers and their families rarely saw a need to place their, Indian, their infants up for adoption. So why, then, did the BIA and the Child Welfare League of America decide to promote adoption. Many Indian groups believed that the government was using child removal and adoptive placement as a way to destroy tribes as part of the whole termination uh, policy and practice of the era. A Devil's Lake Sioux mother, Jeanette Goodhouse, told a reporter that she feared the placing of Indian children in white homes was part of a plan for the slow termination of the tribe. And indeed, when you think about it, adoption presented the ultimate solution to the so-called Indian problem from the point of view of government bureaucrats. Children would have no contact with their Indian tribal communities or with peer groups, as they had the boarding schools. They would grow up in middle-class homes, and thus, thus officials believed Indian children would become truly assimilated into mainstream American culture. But what was even better from their point of view about this solution was that adoptive families would bear the cost of raising the children. So neither the federal government nor the states would have to fund their care. And uh, occasionally, a bureaucrat would admit this. <laughs> Uh, the chief of the BIA's branch of welfare justified the IAP to a supervisor in 1958 by noting this could, in future years, reduce the expenditures of the Bureau for foster home care, since we are now paying for care for a number of children for whom adoption should be possible. So the promotion of Indian adoption served both the assimilationist and cost-cutting imperatives of the termination era. This was truly an untenable solution or situation to Indian families and communities. Indian opposition to the unprecedented loss of their children erupted spontaneously in many different locales in the 1960s and 70s. But Mrs. Fournier and other women on the Fort Totten Reservation becomes, became some of the first to voice their resistance nationally. They found a supportive ally in a national Indian advocacy organization called the Association on American Indian Affairs, or the AAIA, which had been founded in the 1920s. The AAIA had been working, on, working with the Devil's Lake Sioux uh, on the Fort Totten Reservation on other issues when staff members learned of the intervention of Barrett into Mrs. Fournier's home. Local families asked the AAIA for help, and they arranged for a delegation to come from Devil's Lake to New York City and Washington, D.C. in July 1968 for a press conference and to lobby the government. Lewis Goodhouse, the tribal chair, accompanied the group, but the AAIA billed it as a mother's delegation. It included five outspoken women, including Lewis's wife, Jeanette Goodhouse, a mother of 10 children in her 40s, and Mrs. Fournier. The Devil's Lake mothers 
delegation presaged the very prominent role that Indian women would play in the decade-long movement to preserve Indian families and pass the Indian Child Welfare Act. At this press conference and, and the one they also did in Washington, the AAIA sought to frame this issue in very dramatic terms by highlighting the mothers and grandmothers' laments. The director of the AAIA, William Byler, condemned the state action in North Dakota as child snatching. And he charged that the forcible removal of Indian youngsters without due process of law has reached epidemic proportions. The AAIA marshaled very solid evidence to support this claim. They distributed a fact sheet noting that out of 1,100 Indian children on Fort Totten, 275 or 25% had been separated from their families. And they called, the AAIA called upon the federal government to probe the charges by American Indian parents that many of them had been unjustly deprived of their children. As intended, this mother's delegation generated publicity and political action. Journalists who attended the press conference were largely supportive and sympathetic. Marie Kempton wrote a scathing opinion piece for the New York Post, pointing out that Mrs. Fournier has been taking in the lost children of other Devil's Lake families for more than 30 years now. There ought to be a time when Mrs. Fournier is recognized as a woman of a peculiar and special nobility instead of the object of a sheriff's pursuit. The delegation also convinced the president to order an inquiry into allegations about North Dakota uh, policies. After this initial salvo, Indian activists and their AAIA allies sought to find out whether Fort Totten represented a unique case or was part of a wider pattern of intervention into any Indian families across the nation. The AAIA charged a college student, intern, Bertram Hirsch, with gathering data from the BIA and state and private agencies across the country. If you go to their archives at Princeton, they're full of the data that they gather. Hirsch collected some very shocking data in a very painstaking way that found that in states with large Indian populations, Again, that average of 25 to 35 percent of Indian children had been removed from their tribal communities and families. In every state, they found that Indian children were vastly overrepresented in the child welfare system. Hirsch's gathering of this statistical data was invaluable, not only in proving uh, that there was a crisis, but also in helping Indian <coughs> families understand that their personal traumas were part of a larger pattern. When he began this tedious task, Hirsch recalls, Indian people thought, this is my problem. They didn't know that the family, a mile down the road or over the next butte, was experiencing the same thing. Everybody feeling shame about it and not talking about it. They thought it was their own personal circumstance. So people kind of kept it to themselves and they did not seek out assistance from their own tribes. So as a result of collecting and publishing this data, uh, more Indian women and families became emboldened to challenge the removal of their children. And in fact, the AAIA created a legal assistance program for Indian families that was headed by Bert, Bertram Hirsch, who was an attorney by this time. Um, many Indian families who had lost children asked for the assistance of the AAIA legal team in, in regaining their children. This legal team was re remarkably successful, in fact, in, in the defense of Indian families claiming in 1975 that in the more than six years they'd been litigating in this area, they'd won every case. At the same time, Indian activists and the AAIA staff realized that a more drastic solution was necessary than legal case after legal case. And they started to work for comprehensive national legislation that would empower Indian tribes to take over the provision of Indian child welfare services. Uh, the AAIA soon contacted the chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs, a man named uh, James Aberisk, 
of South Dakota, and presented him with their statistics. He committed to holding oversight hearings on the issue, which he convened in April 1974, to determine if the problem merited legislation. At this hearing in 1974, the AAIA interwove testimony from Indian women like Cheryl Day Couteau, Mrs. Fournier, and, as well as social service providers uh, and, and legal and mental health experts. And they developed three main arguments in support of a national Indian Child Welfare Act. First, that Indian families' legal rights have been trampled. Second, that Indian children's best interests have been compromised. <coughs> and third, that complicated funding mechanisms through divided jurisdiction had deprived Indian communities of the necessary economic support they needed to keep Indian children with their families. The 1974 hearings created a national network of Indian child welfare advocates and led to the drafting of an Indian Child Welfare Act. The government held two more sets of hearings in 1977 and 78 to discuss the draft. And by this time, there was a lot of opposition to the bill, and they had mobilized. But Indian activists and their allies had carefully cultivated support for this bill through poignant te testimony of Indian witnesses, coupled with hard statistical evidence compiled by the AAIA. And the Senate passed this bill in 1977, the House of Representatives in 1978, and President Jimmy Carter signed it into law in, in November of 1978. So a battle of spanning at least 10 years had come to fruition through a very well-designed campaign that linked grassroots tribal groups, Indian community organizers and social service providers, and a national advocacy organization. ICWA's primary provisions enabled tribes to take unprecedented sovereignty over Indian children, whether they lived on tribal lands or off the reservation. ICWA sought to provide strong legal protections to Indian families to prevent the abuses that had led to the Indian child welfare crisis. It also contained a number of provisions aimed at providing services to Indian families that were controlled by the tribes themselves that would prevent Indian children from being removed in the first place. And its final section called for a study of the remaining federal boarding schools with an objective of, of eventually closing them for good. This photograph of a gathering of people in a courtroom in the state of Michigan embodies ICWA. Richard and Judith Nelson, a white couple, stand on the left with Edward Waxnice, little boy, a Northern Cheyenne boy they've just adopted through a special session of the Northern Cheyenne Tribal Court held in Escanaba, Michigan. Edward Waxnice holds the hand of his mother, Loretta Waxnice, who sits in a chair in the center of the picture. Terrence Wallace Nelson, an older adopted Indian child, and Blake Waxnice, Edward's older brother, stand together on the other side of Mrs. Waxnice. Northern Cheyenne social workers and courtroom officials stand in the back behind the adoptee and his two families. The Montana Department of Social Services had removed Edward and placed him with the Nelsons at their home in Michigan. The Nelsons filed to adopt Edward in a Michigan court, and the Northern Cheyennes challenged the jurisdiction of the state court, as the recently enacted ICWA now allowed them to do. At this point in many of these cases, there's a long battle that ensues, a long legal battle. But the Nelsons decided to do something different. They voluntarily agreed that the tribal court was the proper forum for deciding the issue. A Michigan state court judge allowed the Northern Cheyenne court to use its courtroom for this special session. The tribal court heard testimony from all involved, as well as from a child psychiatrist who examined the child and the adopted family. The tribal court decided that the adoption should be allowed in accordance with Northern Cheyenne traditional custom and practice. 
Thus, the adoption was granted, but there was no termination of parental rights of the natural family, as is done in non-Indian adoptions. And the Walks Nice family continued to have a relationship with Edward. So in a sense, the way I look at this is that the Northern Cheyennes adopted the Nelsons as part of Edward's extended family as much as the Nelsons adopted Edward. The enactment of ICWA engendered a great deal of celebration and hope in Indian country. Many Indian people regarded ICWA as an important tool of self-determination that could help them in their bid to reclaim the care of their children and to resolve the Indian child welfare crisis. The Devil's Lake Sioux at Fort Totten, where Mrs. Fournier first stood down the Benson County Welfare Board, used federal funds available through Title II of ICWA to establish a family development center. Eventually, it became known as the Lewis Goodhouse Wellness Center. But ICWA has not been a cure-all. Indian children remain overrepresented in their state child welfare systems, although the numbers are not as high as they were in the 1960s and 70s. And here are some statistics about Oregon. They're a little bit outdated. They're from 2009, but they do give you a sense of uh, the pretty striking overrepresentation of Native American children in the child welfare system here. Worse, however, ICWA has been threatened not only by the Supreme Court's ruling in the Baby Veronica case, but also by recent state actions. The state of South Dakota has been skirting the provisions of ICWA by holding rushed and informal emergency hearings to decide child welfare cases, rather than the full evidentiary hearings required by ICWA. In many such cases, some lasting less than 60 seconds, judges have not even allowed Indian parents to speak. Last summer, the ACLU and the Justice Department intervened in the state of South Dakota uh, to try to correct the situation. Beyond the battles that play out in state courts, there's virtually no public dialogue in the United States about the human rights violations that American Indian people suffered up to and really since the passage of ICWA. Arnold Lislow contended that the Indian child was the forgotten child, left unloved and uncared for on the reservation, subject to neglect and abuse. There is some truth to this, but not the way that Lislow meant. In the United States, we have forgotten the Indian children who experienced removal and displacement from their families. We have neglected to collectively investigate and come to terms with the way in which Indian families suffered gross human rights abuse at the hands of state authorities. And our forgetting continues to undermine indigenous families and communities. Thank you. Comments, questions? Yes. Uh, when was the Canadian Aid program put into effect? Uh, 1968. And it went through uh, well into the 70s. Mm -hmm. They changed their name at one point because of the objections of a lot of Canadian Indigenous women who hated the program, hated the way that they advertised their children. Um, and so then they just called it AIM with a lowercase letter, and then they stopped calling it that altogether. But it, the Canadians were not able to um, negotiate uh, agreements until the early 80s to try to stop uh, some of these practices. Yeah? Um, I'm interested, so in the boarding school process, there's uh, moments when uh, Native students are able to kind of find some sort of autonomy, some sort of like group cohesion. You kind of mentioned pan Indianness. And I'm wondering uh, when in adoptees, uh, I know when they did like the workout, like they put them, put Indigenous uh, students in uh, homes and tried to teach them kind of the technical job training type of stuff, there was a sort of um, chances for uh, Indigenous uh, people to kind of find a community, even, even though they've been 
adopted in a wholly different uh, um, kind of uh, setting. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, do you know of any kind of examples of sort of like uh, uh, adoptees doing this, um, kind of finding a place uh, outside of a place, of, you know, outside of this kind of placelessness? Well, that's a really good question, and I think that, again, speaks to the way in which uh, these policies were, in some sense, more destructive uh, than the boarding school policy, even, because children, it was very difficult for them to find one another uh, until many, many years later in their lives, unless they were adopted with uh, siblings or if a family adopted many indigenous children together. Um, one adoptee I interviewed, though, uh, talked about how his his family always encouraged him to dance in the local powwow um, and mm -hmm. to take part in that. Um, so there were some ways in which some parents really encouraged a sense of heritage, but not necessarily a sense of heritage with their own tribe, but with this kind of uh, playing Indian type of heritage. Uh, so, but almost every adoptee I've met or read about has always sought out uh, information about their own tribal communities and have tried to reunite in some way with their communities as adults and tried to find a way back into that community in some way. And there's a really uh, very interesting woman named Sandy Whitehawk who herself is an adoptee who's developed uh, an annual ceremony. She, she lives in St. Paul and she holds this on the University of Minnesota campus every year where she invites adoptees to come take part in the ceremony together, uh, of sometimes with their um, representatives from their own tribal communities, of a, a kind of way of reuniting and linking back into their communities. So it's a very good question, though. Was, but as children, I think it was a tough road, uh, often. Yeah? When you mentioned the co-optation of the rhetoric of choice, mm -hmm. I was really struck by the um, the kind of moment in which this is happening where um, there's a lot of reproductive injustice and violence and also women of color feminists are pointing out that the right to mother is an important part of reproductive justice. Did you come across any of that kind of language among the activists that you spoke with? Um, not, I didn't come across it in the 60s in the, in the archival record. In the mm -hmm. 70s you start to see it um, because this over, this policy overlapped with policies of involuntary sterilization of Native women and other women of color in this period. And so there's a case I came across by a woman named Norma Jean Salina. Uh, she is a mix of tribes from Oklahoma and she married young and she moved to uh, the Pittsburgh area with her husband and her husband abandoned her and she had three children and was pregnant with a fourth and I think I'm getting, might be getting some of these details slightly off, but if you read the book, it's correct in there. <laughs> <laughs> so she goes to the doctor to deliver her most recent child, and the doctor uh, sterilizes her without her consent. Um, and this case becomes one of the cases of, uh, that the Women of Color Network of the 70s sort of goes after and really tries to I think it does help reframe the reproductive justice movement or to almost uh, as a, a precursor to that reproductive justice movement of, and using that rhetoric later because um, of the concern that this isn't just about choice in the terms of right to an abortion, but choice to be a mother or to control my own re reproduction. So, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Just a, a comment, I just think it's interesting to juxtapose the, the cases that you juxtaposed in the beginning, and I can't remember which ones you said, if it was Trayvon Martin or um, what have you, but um, you know, I think it, it speaks to something important in ethnic studies, which is that we always talk about, uh, or people often talk about race as being about people of color, but of course it's centrally about whites and whiteness. But if you go digging around and people are, you know, you're like, where? Where are the white people? I don't know. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so it's if we think of whiteness as being at the center of each of those events, then of course it makes sense. And the comment that you said that uh, this concerns more than just Indians, of course it does, because it's about white supremacy. Um, it's about the 
that ideology of white supremacy that saturates um, the, the culture of the United States. And so it, it makes sense to juxtapose them if we understand whiteness as being the center of, of mm -hmm. uh, race in the United States. Well, building off what you just said, I mean, I think it's interesting that people like the Capo Biancos and others who oppose ICWA think of it as a law about race. And it really, it's a law about sovereignty. And it's, um, for example, I mean, a, a tribe wants their child to grow up Cherokee. They don't want them to grow up Indian. They want them to be Cherokee. They want to, them to learn Cherokee language, Cherokee culture, to be connected to a Cherokee clan. They don't have this idea of, oh, I want to preserve the Indian race. That's not a concept. So, um, but a lot of people who oppose this see it very much in those terms. Um, but you're, you're exactly right. There is a lot of, um, in working out these ideas about uh, so-called rescue of Indian children, there is a way in which the mostly white people who are promoting this policy are working out what it means to be white. So one of the things I found really interesting, maybe my favorite chapter I wrote is about Canada. Um, there is this, uh, these three Métis uh, foster children who are being brought up in a very stable family in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. And welfare authorities come in and remove the three children and place them for adoption in Michigan. And uh, there's a huge uproar in the indigenous community of Prince Albert and such an uproar that the adoptive couple in Michigan ends up giving the children back after six weeks. They come back to Saskatchewan, but the authorities are really punitive, and they never return the children to the original family. And I was able to find an ombudsman report about this case, and I, it, it really kind of blew my mind, because the, it, it admitted that the children were in a happy, loving, caring home. But it said they're not receiving enough stimulation. And so that set me off on a journey to think about, well, what was stimulation? What did that mean to them? And to me, that was a very class and race-laden notion. And that picture I showed you of the family with Noel and the piano and the books. That was what stimulation meant. It was a middle class home with a particular aesthetic, with a particular no notion of what it meant to be uh, a good stimulating family. So I